Welcome to the Winter Energy Seminar. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many of you here. That means that you uh, like uh, like what we've got to hear today, and hopefully for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the quarter. Uh, each uh, quarter, we try to have a theme. Not every talk fits into that theme, but uh, the theme this quarter is going to be renewable energy. And we have, uh, you know, as always, some policy talks, some technology uh, around that theme. So uh, just to give you a little bit of indication of what the lineup is, uh, today uh, we're going to be hearing a really interesting talk about the case for a carbon tax as U.S. climate policy. Uh, that will be Michael Wara and John Wyant uh, teaming up to talk about that. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Dan Riker and Felix Mormon, who will talk about energy policy and politics and theory and practice, a case study in renewable energy finance. Uh, we'll also have one of our Stanford Energy Socials uh, after that uh, next week. Uh, after that, uh, Ram Rajagopal, uh, one of the uh, newer faculty members here, will talk about smart grid and its uh, enabling capability for more renewables. Uh, Yi Shui will be talking about renewable energy technology. I'm not sure if he'll talk about solar or wind, um, but uh, whatever he talks about is always interesting. Um, and then uh, on February 10th, uh, Severin Bornstein uh, from uh, the UC Energy Institute is going to be coming and talking about the, the rebound effect, uh, particularly with regard to the um, energy efficiency. So that will be a, a, a nice addition. And then we're having, uh, the end will, uh, a mini-series. Uh, Mike McGeehy, uh, every other year, leads a mini-series on solar energy. And uh, so he will do a sort of semi or biannual um, a summary of sort of uh, you know emerging and exciting developments in low-cost solar cell technologies. And the second part of um, that mini-series, oh, Oops, I got it backwards. Anyway, Stefan Reichelstein uh, from the business school will be talking about uh, the economics of uh, PV and the, the impacts of the dramatic cost declines that we've seen. And then Mike McGee will talk. And then finally, uh, Kathy Zoe, uh, who's been teaching now here for, uh, for several quarters, uh, is going to be talking about some work that she's done on commercializing wind photovoltaics and batteries, uh, trying to understand the relative impact of uh, of energy policies that promote commercialization as compared to um, financial investments in R&D. So that should be very interesting. She tries to tease apart those issues. So we have a fantastic uh, group of speakers. Thank them all very much in advance. Uh, so as some of you know, this is also a class. And uh, for those of you who are in the class, uh, welcome. It's really great to see you here. Uh, we, uh, as you know, probably you will need to write uh, one paper uh, on what you hear. We'll be communicating with you about that more. Uh, the other thing is, is that after every one of our, our um, lectures, we have a small format meeting where you get together with a speaker and say groups of anywhere between, say, 5 to 15 people. And you'll get uh, really high quality one-on-one -on -one time with them. So uh, we've already got the sign-up sheet um, on the coursework website. So take a look at that. Um, and uh, the other thing is, if you're in the class, you need to sign up on the sign-up sheet. Uh, you're allowed to miss only one of the, the lectures. So that's very important. So please do that. Uh, also remember, we're on the honor system. So please sign it yourself. Um, and again, you'll find it in the back of the room. OK, so uh, anyway, so that is the, that is the plan for the quarter. Uh, I'd now just like to say a little bit more about our speakers today. Uh, Michael Wara is an expert on energy and environmental law, and his research focuses on climate and electricity policy. Uh, his current scholarship lies at the intersection between environmental law, energy law, international rela relations, atmospheric science, and technology po um, policy. Uh, and he's at the Stanford Law School. Uh, he joined in 2007. Uh, then John Wyant is a professor of management science and engineering and director of the Energy Modeling Forum, which is an international collaboration of the group of folks who work on sort of techno-economic uh, analysis of, of energy uh, and climate and, uh, and uh, economics and so forth. And uh, he is uh, you know, broadly acknowledged for, uh, for his contributions, including being a coordinating lead author for many of the IPCC studies, uh, as well as a review editor and, uh, and many other contributions. So with that introduction, I would like to ask Michael, I believe you're going to kick things off. 
So thank yeah. you. So um, we're going to do something a little bit unusual today. We're going to um, sort of tag. Am I? Is that working? OK. We're going to do something a little bit unusual today in that we're going to share um, the, the hour and, and sort of do a little bit of a tag team presentation for you today. John's going to start um, by presenting recent work that um, he, and, and along with the rest of the Energy Modeling Forum, have done to really try to evaluate um, the alternative to what I think we both feel would be a, a strong uh, and effective solution at the federal level to address climate change. And the alternative that we're doing right, that we're in the process of implementing right now really is a, a regulatory command and control prescriptive regulation approach to regulating greenhouse gas emissions source by source across the economy, starting, of course, with coal-fired power plants. Um, so EMF has done a tremendous piece of work trying to evaluate what the, the costs are, costs and benefits are of, of that sort of approach relative to a more economy-wide uh, approach to addressing greenhouse gas emissions. Then I'm going to pick up uh, the ball and hopefully convince you to, of two things. One, that um, we, should, we, sh we should adopt an emissions pricing approach rather than a prescriptive regulatory approach to greenhouse gases in a perfect world that we would do that. And second, that of the two options, cap and trade or a carbon tax, a carbon tax is really the superior alternative. And we're going to show you, I'll show you some analyses that we did for uh, members of Congress in the past session to evaluate various carbon tax proposals and, and show you what the environmental impacts of those proposals would have been had they been adopted and also the costs. Um, so without further ado, um, John, take over. Good, am I on? Can you hear? Uh, for this uh, talk. Um, <laughs> Part of that's we have a major study on U.S. climate policy in press along with a global and European uh, uh, complement, complementary uh, studies. Uh, part of it is we have been working together on this carbon tax thing, so I will go through regulatory policies and cap and trade, which is what we actually did. Uh, the style of models we used, there were 11 of them, uh, actually don't distinguish in terms of their operation between a cap and trade and a carbon tax, so a lot of the pluses and minuses are around that. Uh, very political, of course, a cap and trade leads to uh, a lot of potential political issues regarding who gets what credits when, under what conditions. Uh, the tax code isn't, as Senator Bingaman's here, we can say this, uh, completely devoid of politics either. Uh, <laughs> once you start re, I remember once, just in case you think it's easy, uh, when we first did uh, this revenue recycling, which we now think is definitely a good thing to reconsider to reduce the overall tax burden by using revenues from climate taxes to offset uh, taxes on other parts of the economy, particularly capital in the US and labor in, in, in would be labor if you were talking about Europe. Uh, that uh, the Treasury Department people told us that when somebody came down the hallway with a bill that had revenue recycling implications, they started to shake in their boots, I think is the word. Doesn't mean you don't want to do it. It just means it's not all that uh, easy. Um, so you may recall four years ago, I talked after the big energy modeling forum, uh, global US and EU delineated study uh, was done prior to the Copenhagen round of the Conference of Parties, the big climate negotiations that took place, place at the end of 2009. And I gave a kind of a naughty talk on choke or burn in which I said, well, the Chinese have two choices. Um, one is they can continue to create a lot of air pollution, which would delay the day at which their temperature and global temperatures went up appreciably, or they could clean up the air and live longer and uh, burn up. I think I actually had a Steve Schneider motivated forest burning uh, picture there. Uh, so we did this uh, set of studies. It was like 10 global models, six US models, and three European models. Uh, learned a lot, uh, delivered product to the Copenhagen floor and so on. Not saying that it did 
uh, that, that much good. Uh, and then we went around to mostly the administration, the State Department, uh, the CEQ, Energy Department, um, EPA, and so on, and said, uh, well, what do you think? And they said, well, this is great. Uh, it's kind of an uh, honest broker on the street, good background information, but we hear two things. One is you need to do more realistic policies because we ain't going to do a global cap and trade system, which is what we had mostly focused on, number one. And number two, uh, a lot of people think clean technologies are going to lead to much lower uh, cost for achieving our objectives, which then and now seems to be two degrees C, global mean average temperature relative to pre-industrial. Uh, if you remember, in the uh, uh, 10 talk, we said, if you're only looking at Kyoto gases, 450 parts per million, which translate on expected sciences then and probably now about, would already uh, be in the rear view window, is that the concentration of those gases in the atmosphere was high enough to take you beyond two degrees C, even if you shut down everything completely all over the world. And so the pushback we got there, uh, which still is an active debate, is how many aerosols, black organic carbon, sulfur aerosols, dust, and so on, is there there, and how much time does that buy you? I won't talk about that today. Uh, so we got these two pieces of feedback. You need to do more realistic policies, and you need to do more on technology. So we convened another group, similar to the previous group, and after we got through a couple of meetings, we realized we had the three regions. People wanted to do 20, 30, 40 regions per um, uh, scenarios per region, over 50 models altogether, and too much to do in a single study. So we broke it down into EMF 27 Global, Global which is an on, almost completed online publication of climatic change briefed at uh, the Domestic uh, Policy Council and the team putting together the U.S. Uh, plan for what to tell the international community U.S. climate policy is going to be, or what we think they should be doing and we should be doing as part of that through the COP in Paris in 2015. Um, I won't talk about that. I won't talk about the EU study, which is online, freely accessible at Climate Change Economics, which is built around the current negotiations in Europe uh, regarding what to do there about the next budget period, with or without the US and everybody else. So I won't talk about those. The reason I even mention them here is they have a similar architecture to what we did in EMF 24, which is our US focus study. Uh, so what we did, true to my word, I think, is we looked at uh, optimistic and pessimistic technology scenarios across the rows, the columns in our scenario matri matrix where everything, end use technology, CCS, nuclear, wind, and solar, and bioenergy, were at a optimistic level everything at a pessimistic level, not much change at all, not much improvement, very slow evolutionary, no revolutions. These are quasi-revolutions over here. And then we varied the individual technologies from optimistic to pessimistic, and then did a couple of uh, combined sensitivities where you had a low CS nuke outlook, meaning no CCS and no new nuclear, uh, which put a lot of uh, focus on energy efficiency renewables, and then a low CCS nuclear, which, uh, uh, sorry, I uh, did this backwards. Low renewables put a lot of emphasis on, a lot of pressure on CCS and nu nuclear to come through and carry the ball and vice versa. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, I didn't mean to go there. I meant to go there and there. So I actually said this right, but pointed to the wrong thing. So combined sensitivities, low CCS nuclear, which would be optimistic, uh, renewables and uh, energy efficiency and low EERE, which means uh, not much improvement uh, in either quarter relative to historical trends. We did include historical trends in there. So that's the technology dimension of the study. I'll give a few uh, summary conclusions from that and how that worked out. And then I'll talk about the policy side and come back to the regulatory policies vis-a-vis -vis the cap and trade, which for our purposes here, you could think of as being what these models would do if you gave them a carbon tax. So if you put on a cap and trade and you have a constraint and you have an optimizing model, it basically does a shadow price that's the optimal carbon uh, tax. So unless you have a more complexity in, in, th in there, as Michael will describe in the more refined analysis we did with the NEMS model, uh, 
uh, that's kind of your ball game. So here's the technology assumptions. This will seem pretty rough to you. It's actually the first time this has been done in a coordinated way where we said, well, we don't really know what an optimistic and a pessimistic outlook would be in great detail. Sue's saying the future, lots of uncertainty. I defy anybody here to stand up and say they know a better optimistic and pessimistic in any of these dimensions because then you, not me, would be cross-examined. So, so what we try to do is just to show what the possibilities might be to pick a very optimistic and a very uh, run-of-the-mill, not very optimistic thing. So the obvious ones for nuclear and CCS are either you can't do it technically or politically or public opinion-wise at all, or economics rules everything, and you can do whatever the model says the economics dict dictate. Similar thing on nuclear with the nuclear phase-out being the low-tech scenario. Wind and solar and bioenergy were a little bit more difficult. We had to go through what all the groups were doing individually. Remember, these are models that are used for national, in this case, and in EMF 27 for international policy making all the time. So you could say, well, we don't believe the models and we don't believe your numbers. Uh, but the fact is, these are the tools that are used to produce the, uh, the numbers that people do use in the negotiations. Uh, so this is the technology. Uh, dimension of the study. So remember, I had an op everything optimistic, everything pessimistic. I had things on the high-tech optimistic side turning off one technology area to low-tech at a time, and then I had everything at the pessimistic level when we started. So first of all, uh, the optimistic energy efficiency was a 20% reduction in uh, energy demand per unit of GDP in 2050 compared to what people normally used as their baselines. So where does this come from? This is the stuff that Amy Levins told us was easy to do 35 years ago. <laughs> and it turned out it actually wasn't. Uh, thanks to people like Jim Sweeney here, we now have some hope through behavioral research of having an improved outcome on that score. So the low-hanging fruit, which surely must be rotting by now, <laughs> might actually get picked in the next little bit. So we said, well, rather than wait for those studies uh, to produce results, we would simply uh, assume a 20% reduction in energy use per unit of GDP uh, just as a way to bound what a, feasible, what a reasonable set of outcomes might be through, through 2020. Uh, this, by the way, Jim can confirm or deny this was actually something that was picked up in the America's Energy Future report as a possibility with a lot of uh, assumptions and caveats. So we said, what the heck? Rather than, again, say there isn't anything there, even though we know all this research is going on, let's just take a reasonable estimate and see what difference it makes. And of course, it does good. But again, shame on you, Amory, it doesn't solve the problem. So even a very optimistic 20% for nothing so nothing cost anymore. This is possible that the net cost would be zero, but I would say not a slam dunk. Uh, you would have a much lower baseline to work with. So if you were to try to reduce uh, emissions, and we worked mostly on a flat emissions vis-a-vis -vis 2005, 80% reduction and a 50% reduction, uh, this is actually obviously going to be helpful, but doesn't solve the problem in and of itself. Uh, a couple of little technology tidbits here. Uh, this shows what the sectoral breakdown of emission reductions are across electricity, transport, industry, and residential and commercial from the different models. In 2050, for a 50% reduction, the solid line and a 80% reduction relative to 05 by 2050 linearly imposed from 05 to actually from, from now until 2050. Uh, one thing you can see in this one, which is this optimistic CCS and nuclear, so you don't have a lot of renewables and energy efficiency, is you actually get more than 100% reduction. Very controversial. This carries through all three studies. Uh, the idea here is if you really, really had to and you're really, really serious about 2 degrees C, uh, you could actually do something like biofuels efficiently grown with a high uh, a carbon intensity reduction index and sequester the carbon out of the stack there. Now, you might object to that and think more 
It could be something like direct error capture, and that's fine. So there's papers about direct error capture as an alternative. But anything that would give you that kind of backstop behavior, which does a couple of things. One is it makes it easier to hit a target. It also makes it possible, but not again, a slam dunk to let concentration levels go above what might stabilize the atmosphere at some temperature and then come back again by the end of the century. Uh, just to show we aren't completely crazy, we actually did it for the other scenario, which was uh, optimistic renewables without CCS. And that led to uh, a lot of uh, uh, tree planting, but no CCS and no bio, uh, bio CCS. Uh, here's the electric generation in 2050 and the 50% and 80% reduction cases. You see here some uh, energy demand reductions here and some negative gray bars here for energy reduction, which simply means your electricity is such a good deal at a high pro uh, effective carbon price tax, tax case uh, that you actually reduce uh, demands outside the electric sector. Here's the spaghetti diagram. Uh, even our groups are still apologetic about this. I claim if you look at the range of policy uncertainties and technology uncertainties, this is actually about the way the real world works right now, as a wide range of outcomes are possible, which, as Michael will tell you, is one additional advantage for the tax treatment. So the models provide estimates of carbon prices. They're all over the place. Technology has a large uh, effect. Uh, but it's not clear that any sig single technology is more important than others. Decarbonization of electricity by 2050 is robust across all models, and more research needs uh, needed regarding the potential for end-use reductions associated welfare. I would say we did create plausible scenarios with no CCS and no nuclear that weren't much more expensive for the first time. Now, why could that be? It could be because we haven't done anything for the last 20 years, so the cost is coming down and the potential is going up. Here's the uh, policy side. Here we get much closer to where Michael's going to take us. How do sectoral policies interact with economy-wide policy? And what is the potential for regulatory policies as opposed to market, broad-based market instruments? And then, because we'd had the technology dimension going on, how might technological improvements and technology available influence the answers to these two questions? So now we're back to policy. So we did. Same old, same old is in the 09 study, a baseline, a 50% reduction relative to 05 for US uh, total greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050 and an 80% reduction. And then we did CAFE standards uh, for considered CAFE standards in the transport sector, a renewable portfolio standard, or with Jeff Bingham in here, a nod to him and Steve Chu, a clean energy standard. Uh, on the uh, electric side, combination of the two, and then everything together, a cap and trade on a sectoral policy thing. Uh, so now I'm going to talk just briefly about the policies. So you have economy-wide cap and trade, which for these models is the same thing as the carbon tax. Transport sectors were represented by corporate average fuel efficiency economy standards for light-duty vehicles, and they have to improve by about a factor of three by 2050 to get to the this low level is not a slam dunk, but not impossible. The electric sector, either you do a renewable portfolio standard with standard renewable counting within that cap to hit the target, or you do a clean energy standard where you essentially get half credit for gas and full credit for nuclear. These policies do not, in this case, Michael will take us closer to specific legislative uh, and administration proposals, but they kind of bound it. So we had done Waxman, Markey, and everything else, if you remember, the last time. So we wanted to span the space of what possibly might come just to give an idea of some of the trade-offs and opportunities involved. Uh, so with this kind of architecture, some of the team did some pretty useful summary statistics. Here we have the, uh, the reduction in gigaton CO2 equivalent in CO2 accumulated through 2050 on the y-axis and the net present value of total cost here measured by a discounted pres uh, present value of consumption. I'll talk about alternative metrics in a second. And you get this kind of efficient frontier thing. So here's the flat uh, go back or not above uh, current uh, or 05 levels of emissions. Here's the 50% reduction and here's the 80% reduction. As has been the case in pretty previous studies, this is a bit nonlinear. 
uh, here. Nothing goes kind of off the charts at this way. We have the optimistic renewable uh, uh, energy and efficiency case and the optimistic CCS and new case. So far, no regulatory policies at all. But guess what? If you do this calculation and then do the regulatory policies and cost them out, you can place them on the same plot to see how far away uh, they are. Uh, as I mentioned, for the economist here, we did do a comparison of this same thing. This is an animation that normally takes about 45 minutes, but I'm just giving you the final slide in them. Uh, here's again the uh, consumption loss case, exactly the same diagram. Keep your eyes on the ball here. With the same y-axis, we do um, first the economist's favorite cost metric. Whoops which seems to have gotten lost in there. If you do, I think I put it as a backup slide. If you do equivalent variation, which is the economist's favorite CGE uh, metric, you get almost exactly the same curve. If you do GDP, which may be more easy to understand and therefore communicate, uh, you actually get about half the models give much higher uh, cost in GDP terms than either consumption loss or um, uh, uh, equivalent variation costs. Uh, this brief, we did a briefing on this study for three hours in DC, the day of the uh, September 16th, remember it well, the day of the Navy Yard shooting to DC, which lost us about 10 or 15% of our audience. Uh, so I wanna set Michael up now and really get to the chase on why we think market-based instruments in general and carbon taxes in particular are such a good Idea. The cap and trade scenarios assume per capita lump base, uh, per capita based lump sum recycling of revenue. Uh, again, that is not a great way to recycle revenues from a public finance point of view. We've seen worse in this country, uh, but we also have seen and could see better in terms of what other taxes one might reduce or whether or not this income is redistributed to the population as, uh, as a whole is well known from the literature, including a host of Experts, uh, Ian Perry from RFF, our own Larry Goulder, a couple of people in Holland and so on, built this literature uh, that using carbon re revenue uh, to lower pre-existing distortionary taxes may uh, yield substantial, substantial efficiency gains. As I mentioned, I think the state of the art was and still is. If you use it to re reduce double taxation on capital in the US, that works pretty well. If you use it to reduce labor taxes in Europe, that works pretty well. Europe, due to differences in model representation of the fiscal system, other than the, the model that Michael and uh, Jordan Wilkinson here worked on, which was a variant of a model that was included in the study, uh, nobody could actually do this calculation within our study. So again, we view these numbers as kind of a bound on, an upper bound on cost. Uh, here's the individual model case. This is kind of a, again, a 45 minute buildup. Uh, but I've shown here for each model, the efficient frontier, again, using the discounted present value consumption metric for the models. And this is the uh, blue is 80% cap and trade, the light green, 50%. The dark blue, you can see them right on the efficient frontier, which is how the efficient frontier was drawn. We actually did all the intervening 10 percentiles as well. And what you see is if you do instead either a CES or an RPS, and the CAFE standards, uh, you are sometimes not too far from the efficient frontier, but sometimes very far away. Meaning uh, you spend two to four times as much uh, money uh, to achieve a particular level of reduction using uh, the regulatory policies as opposed to the market-based, uh, economy-wide market-based uh, policies. Um, so you may, though, so it's kind of a hard thing to figure out. You may notice there are a few here for uh, the clean energy standard with no new coal, meaning you can only build new coal plants with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. A few of the models, this one, this one, and this one, actually are slightly below and therefore better than lower cost or more emission reductions per unit cost uh, than the efficient frontier. On uh, that also, uh, we look to the literature to help explain. So the point here, which is the Michael setup, uh, is uh, a lot of these regulatory policies are way above the cost of the market-based uh, policies. Uh, and 
if you're lucky and the world has to, happens to work like one of these models that has a regulatory outcome that's close to the efficient frontier and the conditions are the external uh, drivers of the analysis are similar to what we use in this study, then you might be able to do it. If you do the market-based instrument, you don't have to worry about all that. It'll be efficient for whatever the state of nature is and whatever the, the, uh, the model is. But I thought I would explain a little bit why you get this counterintuitive result here as one possible thing to look out for. And that says that for some of the models, uh, uh, have a smaller welfare impacts for the regulatory policy, particularly this uh, carbon clean energy standard with uh, no new coal without CCS. In the first best world, this never happens because the efficient frontier is the efficient frontier in that world. Um, what happens here is you have pre-existing taxes in your economy. Again, something Larry Goulder and uh, the I'm um, forgetting the guy, his name from uh, Holland and Ian Perry has referred to as the tax interaction effect. So that explains why it shouldn't be too surprising that if you're really, really lucky, you'll actually get some of these outcomes that are slightly better than the efficient frontier outcome. So at this point, I've tried to demonstrate that regulatory policies often cost two to four or more times for the same environmental outcome uh, as the market-based instruments. I've argued that the models we used which did look across a wide range of policy architectures and technology assumptions, uh, actually uh, did a set of calculations for a cap and trade outcome, which for those models which don't have the inner um, public finance and money flows to do a uh, revenue, recycling uh, rev revenue recycling calculation. The one other thing I will mention, because Michael's going to pick up on this, is we also didn't look except for one model at income distribution. So as Senator Bingaman can tell you, there's always a lot of problems with that. He'll be happy to know that for that one model for the clean energy standard, it actually turns out that if you combine that with the CAFE standards, the clean energy standard is slightly regressive. The CAFE standards are slightly progressive and you put them together, it just turns out that you're not so bad off. But Michael's going to take off on that and on steroids and show you a, a a little bit more about that dimension of the problem. Michael. OK, so um, let me just switch presentations here quickly. Um, and how do I make this full screen? Full screen. So I'm going to talk about work uh, that's the result of a collaboration between John and myself. And, and really, most importantly, is this working? Yeah? Most importantly, a uh, uh, number of students, one of whom is in the room, Jordan Wilkerson, another, Danny Cullenward, who were absolutely critical to this work and, and provided really import, important contributions. Um, and as I say, we received financial support from the Precord Institute and from the Steyer Taylor Center to help us afford some of the more expensive components of the models that we used. Um, so at the outset, I just want to emphasize one thing. And in the world of you know, political reality, you know, we have to ask ourselves, it'd be great if we, get a, if we could optimize for a 50 to 80% cut in emissions by 2050. But our reality is probably somewhat different. And my view is that we need to really focus on the energy innovation challenge, right? How to create the right incentives, how to create as much force push as we can toward innovating in the energy sector in the way that we uh, utilize, trans transform, utilize energy um, as possible, given the political limits. You know, and so my shorthand for this is how to create the development we observed in China. That's Shanghai in 1990 and 2010, 20 years of transformation there, lifting people out of poverty, giving people much better, more interesting opportunities where they have much greater control over their lives. How do we do that without wreaking havoc on the climate? Right? That's, the, that's, a, that's a repeat photograph of the Athabasca Glacier in Alaska over about a century of time without wreaking havoc on the climate and everything else, ecosystems, that depend on climate. So that's the challenge. Um, I'm going to talk about four things relatively quickly. <laughs> Emissions pricing, the received wisdom on emissions pricing. I'm going to talk about information in the regulatory process, in particular in terms of cap and trade. And that is you know, why the, 
The war room is up on this slide, right? The, 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 the unintended consequences that can ensue when you have very complicated policies that you're trying to implement through a regulatory process that's subject to normal political economy. Um, and then we'll talk about some carbon tax proposals and our evaluations of those. So um, first of all, why do we like emissions pricing? What's good about it? Um, one point that John highlighted is that it is economically efficient. It produces either, you know, two, there are sort of two ways to look at this simplistically, the most reductions for your dollar, uh, or um, potentially more greater reductions in pollution for the uh, same amount of money spent. Um, in that sense, it produces a surplus relative to more traditional command and control regulatory approach that can be divided between industry, which gets to pay lower costs for its compliance, and the environment, which may get greater reductions, greater improvements in environmental quality. Um, a, a not unimportant additional advantage of emissions pricing is it doesn't assume that the regulator knows everything there is to know about how to control emissions cost effectively. That is an enormous challenge. The regulator does not have the information necessary to do this. Typically, the owners of pollution sources have the best information about how to reduce their emissions cost effectively, and they don't want to give that up to regulators. So this is a, this is a traditional problem. Emissions pricing gets around it because it creates a price, a, 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 an economic incentive for the regulated community to respond. And the regulator doesn't have to know anything about the hows and whys of that response. They just need to know that either the emissions are coming down to meet a cap or that the regulated community is facing a fixed price for their emissions. Um, and finally, in a dynamic sense, emissions pricing can be technology forcing, right? It can, it can drive, it can create an, an economic incentive, a carrot out there for innovators to go and get and grab and, 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 and harness. Um, and so can help to drive forward this process of energy innovation that's gonna be really important in this century. Um, this figure, which is, uh, I stole from uh, Larry Goulder, um, and it's, he really copies it, he models it on a figure in a famous paper by uh, Weitzman, um, just illustrates that if we have perfect information, which we never have, but if we did, um, that the, um, and, and perfect information in the sense that we know both, uh, we know the cost to abate pollution, to reduce pollution for any given level of pollution, that's the marginal abatement cost curve, then um, uh, a price-based mechanism, a carbon tax in, in, the, in the discussion today, is gonna be equivalent, you can make an equivalence to a cap and trade program, that quantity and price can be traded off against each other. You could set a cap, that will produce a given price. You can set a tax that will produce a given outcome in terms of pollution with perfect information. And of course, everyone knows we don't have that. That's what the Weitzman article was about so long ago. And, and there's been a, there's a substantial literature moving forward on these. So, so the reality is that we tried one of these policies and not the other to a substantial degree. We've, we've really focused on cap and trade in the US and globally. And so why is that? What's the received wisdom? Why, do we, why, do we, why focus on cap and trade? I think there are, there, are, there are a number of reasons that come out of the traditional you know, air quality, local air pollutant context, and then there are some that have to do with climate. I'm talking about focus on the local air pollutant context. Title IV of the Clean Air Act, that's the Acid Rain Trading Program, was added to the Clean Air Act in 1990. And to at least most people, the vast majority of people who've looked at this issue closely view it as a tremendous success. This is a figure that shows uh, sulfur dioxide air quality, um, sort of a national average of that. It's a little bit complicated to explain exactly what the data is. I won't go into it, but the, the and the, the black line is the national standard. I think there's a pointer here I should actually start using. Uh, is the national ambient air quality standard. And you can see that SO2 emissions have gone down even as electricity demand and GDP have grown dramatically across this period. And a substantial part of the reason for this reduction is a cap and trade program that was successfully implemented. Um, in addition, uh, subsequent to that, EPA implemented something called the NOx SIP call, which is a cap and trade program for nitrogen oxide emissions. Those are emissions that lead to particulate matter and um, ground level ozone. Um, 
Both of these policies created an impression, a received wisdom, that really is two, two, revolved around two things. One is that cap and trade has great politics in the sense that when you set a cap on emissions, divide it up into a uh, set of permits, you have, you've created a valuable asset that can be distributed to individuals who dislike the policy you're trying to enact, right? You can bribe people in the political process with permits. And that was done successfully in, uh, to, to remove opposition to the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments and in the NOx SIP call context as well. Um, the other advantage, at least perceived advantage, was that there wasn't a lot of litigation. These policies were relatively easy to implement from EPA's perspective because they didn't have to go source by source and regulate, specify a technology, specify an emissions limit, and then be sued source by source. Uh, and so they were relatively pain free from an implementation perspective. Now, I'm going to argue, how do I, yes, that the, the process in the process in the greenhouse gas emissions context has been very different. The experience has been very different. Principally, what we've observed is overallocation in greenhouse gas cap and trade programs that have been implemented to date. What overallocation means is very simple. It just means that the cap that's set is greater than or equal to the actual emissions observed. There's no scarcity of permits. What that means is the carbon price is zero, or at least is at the, the minimum price that's set by the system. And what that means is that there's very little pressure on industry or on innovators to change, right? You basically get the minimum outcome. Um, that's, uh, those of you know, that's Tolstoy. He famously said once that all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy for different reasons. And if you talk to experts about any of these programs, they'll give you a long story about the specific reasons why they were over allocated, right? There are always specific reasons. I'm gonna argue that there's really one reason. And the reason has to do with our ability to forecast emissions, right? In order to set a cap, you have to know what emissions are gonna be. And I don't think we know that very well. This is a figure that, I, um, that you could put together if you were interested in this kind of thing, from the EIA's website. They're pretty transparent, but it, it shows in red here actual energy-related CO2 emissions from 1996 to 2012. That's the most recent data we have. And then how EIA's forecasts have changed over that time interval in their an annual energy outlooks. Okay, Big changes, right? This just shows you, takes that data and takes it one step further and says, how big is the change in year, when, when you look at years after the forecast is made? So what's the forecast error in the NEMS, in, sorry, in the annual energy outlook? And what you can see is that the error grows with time and then may stabilize, although I'm a little skeptical of the stability because we're starting, this is a, these are fewer, there are fewer samples at this end of the data set than at this end. So this is, this is really th only three, down here we have, um, 10 or 12 annual energy outlooks to work with. Now, and these show the standard deviation of the forecast error through time. And you can see that it, it grows and then seems to stabilize. The axis here, zero to roughly a billion metric tons. That's about 20% of US emissions, okay? So the forecast error over a 10 year period is 20% of US emissions. Now, who cares? Well, this arrow here represents the cut, the cut we promised below 2005 emissions at Copenhagen, 17% cut in US emission, in 2005 US emissions. This arrow here represents the average time from passing legislation to actually phasing in a cap of federal uh, cap and trade bills, proposals that have been made over the last decade. So you can see you've got about five years. Some are shorter, some are three, some are longer, some say seven. So you need to be able to forecast your cap in year one of the cap and trade program for a relatively modest cut, typically 60, 100 million tons, average five, at least three to seven years in advance. And you can see that you just can't do that, right? So another way to look at this is, what if we pass some bills? Um, these are five of the major 
pieces of cap and trade legislation that were introduced in the, United, in the US in the last decade, um, I use a metric called emissions to cap. And that's pretty straightforward to understand. It says what were capped emissions, and it subtracts the cap from them. So covered sectors emitted a certain amount or were forecast to emit a certain amount. Subtract the cap, see what you get. If the cap is binding, the number is below zero. That means that um, emissions it were projected to be greater than the cap. If the cap doesn't bind, that means uh, then you get a number that's, that's above zero. So you can see that most of these bills, um, when, you, when you include the flexibility that's provided by offsets, come in with caps that bind. Those that don't um, are, are the, the flexibility to be above um, observed emissions is coming from offsets. But look at the dramatic transformation that occurs when you update the forecast from when the bills were proposed, right, using the EIA forecast that were used to design the legislation to what we guess now for emissions. And this is just from um, the date that the cap and trade bills would have been phased in to 2030. Right? So you see a dramatic, this represents a dramatic reduction in abatement effort. And also the fact that all of these bills would have produced something like a zero carbon price or a price of carbon at the price floor had they been adopted when they were proposed, given what we know now. So I take this to mean that the quantity approach to cap and trade has some problems. But the fundamental problem is it relies on a forecast of emissions. And, it, and the fact is we don't know how to forecast emissions reliably. Um, forecast error typically is greater than the reductions. Um, that makes this curve, the marginal abatement cost curve, highly uncertain. And in a context where we're not doing the optimal policy, we're doing the politically feasible policy. That is incredibly important because it means that cap and trade produces a highly uncertain return on investments of political capital on pe for, on, for, for people who care about climate. Right? You might get something, but you might get nothing. So there's a real uncertainty of outcome where we're in the suboptimal real world. So, I look at that and I say, wow, we should think about carbon taxes. And uh, last year, we were approached by a number of members of Congress who were thinking as well about carbon taxes. Uh, um, Senators Boxer and Sanders, Representative Waxman, Senator Whitehouse, who were floating proposals, floating trial balloons in the session with really no expectation that they would pass, but with a desire to you know, understand the legislation, understand the costs and benefits of it, and, and explore its consequences with other representatives. And they asked us to tell them what would happen. What would happen from an environmental perspective? What would happen from an economic perspective? And we used the model that EIA uses, the National Energy Modeling System, to do that assessment. Now, this is a bottom-up, partially equilibrium energy economy model. It's extremely complicated to run. Um, it is cumbersome, in the words of one of our, uh, our uh, grant reviewers. Um, but the reality is that it's the gold standard for doing uh, scoring of bills. It's the, it's, the, it's the model that is used by Congress to evaluate energy proposals for uh, changes to, to, to the energy laws of this country. Um, so. Let me just skip that because we're, we're running short on time. We took, um, I'm just going to show you results from one of the policies to try to get a, to, to show you what we found. We were interested to learn not just um, what these bills would say, but more generally what a sophisticated model would tell us about the US energy system post recession, right, and post shale gas revolution. Right? We've had a dramatic both economic and energy transformation over the past three years. The reality is that most of the economic and, and um, environmental evaluation of federal policy occurred before both of those events. And so we wanted to know now, in the current policy and economic environment, what would happen if a relatively efficient policy were implemented. So just to, borrow, just to take one of these policies, the, the Climate Protection Act, that was a Senate bill. 
imposed a $20 fee in 2014 on energy-related CO2 only. Uh, it um, escalated that fee at a 5.6% rate for 10 years, had an upstream point of regulation to minimize costs, so regulating at the mine mouth rather than the power plant. Um, and then, because the folks proposing it were progressive and concerned about any regress, re regressivity in a carbon tax, <coughs> rebated 60% of the revenue to households on a per capita basis. Um, took, funded some various energy efficiency policies and then gave the rest a deficit reduction. Net impact of that was that it raised a total fee of about $1.3 trillion over 10 years, um, gave about $800 billion of it back to households, and used about $300 billion of it for deficit reduction. So what happens environmentally when you do that? What's the impact on emissions? Uh, this, this figure just illustrates that. Here you see on the top is the baseline reference case. Uh, it's the AEO 2013 reference case. And here you see the impact on emissions of a $20 carbon tax escalating at this rate. In the little diamond there is the Copenhagen Accord commitment to reduce our emissions relative, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact language, uh, in a, approximately 17% by below 2005 levels by 2020. And you can see that roughly this magnitude of policy will accomplish that. Great. At what cost, right? I mean, I'm sure if you said that to many in industry, they would say that the sky will fall and Christmas will be canceled. Only the best model that we have for uh, evaluating these policies indicates something far different from that. This is uh, years 2010 to 2023, the first 10 years of the program, 2014 to 2023, and GDP, US GDP. And you can see that there is an impact. The red line is the policy scenario. The gray line is the reference case. Um, there is a modest impact. It's about, in 2020, it's about, uh, it's less than half a percent of GDP. That's real money in a $20 trillion economy, but it's a couple of months of growth as well. Um, another important thing to take away from this slide is that the growth rate doesn't change, right? The economy adjusts to this new type of uh, pollution tax and then keeps growing, at least according to this model. It's just one model. It's important to emphasize. So um, as John mentioned, the representatives, the, 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 we took an additional step, which was really to evaluate how this policy would impact households at different incomes and how the rebate structure in particular would impact the outcome for uh, income quintiles. Now, it's important to emphasize, I want to show you this work, that um, this is not all, we can't, there's, there's no good way to evaluate all of the impacts, in particular, the impacts on income um, at the household level by income quintile, given the structure of the macroeconomic model that we had to work with. We're using a particular model. We don't have the ability to simulate, say, how folks in the, in the lower 20% by income are impacted either in terms of their household income or their household taxation level. But what we can do fairly accurately is take a good guess at how their energy prices change and what the magnitude of their rebate would be if we return 60% of the revenues. And what you can see here, here's the average person, the average household in the United States, and then by quintile, lowest, second, third, fourth, and the highest 20% of income earners. Everyone in the lower 80% by income is actually doing better when you compare their, the change, the increase in energy costs due to the carbon tax relative to the rebate that they get from Uncle Sam. Um, highest 20% is worse off largely because they fly a lot of it, they fly around in airplanes a lot of the time, as far as we can tell. Um, another interesting question that's important to assess in the political context is how do the regions do? Right? If California and the Northeast are doing great while the, the Midwest takes it in the chin because they have a lot of coal in the energy mix, that's politically unacceptable. Right? It doesn't matter how great the policy is in the national aggregate. So we took a regional look, looking at the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, and the West. And while we show, we show that there are certainly variations in the, in the relative benefits to different regions, right? this is, again, 
the increase in household energy costs offset by the, by the rebate, still um, the, the net benefit to households is, is, is somewhere between $100 and $200 per year. So their people are better off on average, the average household. Not everybody, but the average household. Um, finally, I just want to show you that there's certainly other options. The, the bicameral climate change task force floated a discussion draft of carbon tax bills as Waxman and White House. And they specified a range of policies. And, and uh, Jordan uh, Wilkerson really took the lead in evaluating all of these, or sort of a, a, a range of policies by initial carbon price and escalation rate to show that we can obviously go less than that. This is a $15 fee uh, escalating at 2%. And we can go much further uh, in terms of emissions reductions, $35 uh, initial price escalating at 8%. Um, so we can produce a range of outcomes. None of these have dramatic economic impacts. Um, so in conclusion, um, you know, this guy is this guy is coming for the electric power industry, right? EPA is showing up at their door demanding likely costly, inefficient reductions in emissions to comply with uh, their the EPA's legal authority, legal mandate to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, likely that's going to change the BATNA for Congress. That's going to change the incentives to legislate. The question is how and at what point. Uh, I think we've shown, I showed you that a real cap and trade program likely requires information we do not have. We do not know the marginal abatement cost curve well enough to do that policy, at least as far as we can tell. Carbon taxes are much less forecast dependent because you don't have to know emissions in the future to get people to change their behavior in the future with a carbon tax. Um, in addition, carbon taxes similar to current proposals will cut emissions substantially at modest cost to the economy as a whole and to households. Um, and carbon taxes can be designed <coughs> to mitigate their more aggressive impacts for low income households. So that's it. Um, and I guess we have a little time for questions. Sorry, Sally. <laughs> Students here, um, don't be shy. <laughs> um, yeah, so, any students have questions? Yeah, okay. Questions for uh, Michael. Um, Michael. You were saying that the cap and trade system would be like inefficient because we don't know the forecasts, and so what we end up doing is we end up forecasting too much, and then there's no incentive to actually do anything. Uh, so, the question is, like, can we just underestimate? and make it more painful. So just just say, well, we know that the huge standard of deviation, so let's just be rigorous and be as sort of cut, cut through as possible, then kill them, and that will like have to In the bubble here, in Northern California, maybe we could, right? But in the big, in the national conversation, no, we cannot. The, 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 the stringency of the cap is coupled to two things, right? The, the forecast cost of the policy at the time the policy is being discussed, and the goodies, the allowance allocation, who's getting bought off to what degree in the process. And those two things are linked. You can give more allowances away for a more stringent cap, up to some limit where you have no more allowances to give away. Or you could have a looser cap and sell more, make, make, uh, make uh, polluters pay more of the allowances. But there is, a real, there is a real limit in the stringency. You can't, I think it's really unlikely that we could make, you know, the, the error that I find is, is on the order of a, a billion tons. That's 20% of US emissions. We're not going to make a program 20% more stringent to correct for our forecast error. OK, students, um, yes, back there. Yeah, yeah. How did, uh, how did Boxer's staff come up with the escalator? And what's the sensitivity on the facts on GDP to the the changes in the escalator? Um, the sensitivity is relatively modest. Um, we never get above 1% of GDP or about eight months of economic growth in terms of the impact in the out years of our uh, simulations. Um, the, 
boxer staff. I th how, would you choose, how would you choose one? If you know, I'm agnostic. I, I, w I support effective climate policy, <laughs> however, however shaped or enacted. Um, the, you know, I think what we've shown is that you can get the same outcome uh, with a higher escalator and a lower initial price or a lower escalator and a higher initial price. And you can get, there, there are multiple ways to get to the same endpoint. And the question is, what's, what's your endpoint? Um, what do you want to accomplish with the policy? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about, it sounds like you're, you can either have uncertainty in the results or you can have uncertainty in the economic, um, you know, like either the price changes or the quantity changes, right? Because the marginal abatement curve kind of shifts up to the right answer. Could you talk a little bit about that trade-off and, you know, why you prefer one to be uncertain as opposed to the other and talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So, so the, uh, your, char, char, yeah, char Charles? Is referring to you know the the uncertainty that you have when you, when you choose a quantity instrument a cap, you have uncertainty in the economic impacts. When you choose a price um, sort of regulation, you have uncertainty in the quantity and and uh, in the in the level of environmental in the level of pollution abatement. Um, that analysis. Um, so why do I favor one over the other? That analysis assumes that we're choosing first of all in an environment similar to the one that John has modeled, where we're, where we're modeling an optimal policy, and we're not, right? The reality is we're doing much less than we probably should about this problem. There's a much lower willingness to pay for this than is necessary to avoid two degrees. Heck, I want to avoid six degrees Celsius, right? That's my, pro my worry is we get to 2100 and we have, we're on the six degree tra trajectory, not the two degree or the three degree. Three degrees would be great. So, so how do we get on that three degree scenario, right? It's, it's, it's likely that we're gonna propose, propose a set of policies that are really suboptimal, at least initially. And so in that suboptimal policy environment, the key thing is to make sure that firms, polluters, and consumers of goods that are created with pollution, right, us, feel some pressure to do things differently. And what I'm showing is you can't actually predict very much about the pressure that's going to be felt using a cap and trade system, given the forecast error. However, with a carbon tax, you can predict a lot about the level of economic pressure, the, 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 the push that firms are going to feel to do things differently and to innovate. And I think that is an important distinction in a suboptimal environment, given the level of imperfection of information that we have. So can I put these last two together? I think the um... The fact is, the, the tax approach, what you would really like to do is equilibrate the marginal um, discounted present value cost of the emission reduction with the marginal uh, discounted present value of the climate impacts you're going to see. This would be, this is actually generically known as the social cost of carbon, which is another three hour seminar. Uh, <laughs> so that's actually highly uncertain. So you're likely to not get that right. So let's not fool ourselves about that. On the other hand, I think Michael made the strongest point for the price versus quantity, uh, and that is you don't really know the information to have whatever emission reductions you trigger uh, be at least minimum, at least total cost, which means the marginal reduction in every sector has to be exactly the same. If not, just go through the logic. You can lower costs by doing more in the lower cost sector and less in the higher cost sector. I think it's as simple as that. So it, as Michael alluded to, in the, in the modeling, oftentimes we'll do a kind of analysis as if we know all the information, and then they are exactly equivalent. One thing we tried to show with our regulatory policies versus cap and trade is if you just make a stab at that, and some of the stabs weren't so bad, we showed, but some were quite expensive. This is exactly as Michael had put it. So I think that's one way to think about how uncertainty factors in this, and one way to think about what the optimal tax is. It's something. The, the optimal tax is normally in an a economic growth model would be rising at something approximating the rate of return on capital for various reasons, slightly adjusted. We have one more question, and I believe you were the first person to get your hand up. So, uh, no, thank you very much. I'm with uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. <coughs> Obviously, we are very much for our 
carbon tax with 100% uh, recycling. Uh, recently heard Nick Stern up at the Commonwealth Club receiving the Steve Schneider Award, and he was talking about 1% to 3% of GDP being spent or invested to prevent massive worldwide GDP loss from climate disasters. Uh, and my question is, how, given the uncertainties that you've talked about in forecasting energy usage, how do you bring into your models the forecasts of these unstoppable climate disasters that will cost us, it's perhaps the, fri the price of our civilization, how do you value that in your denominator as you calculate what we ought to be paying up front as the present value in order to avoid enormous destruction at the other end? Prove it. I mean, there, there is a huge debate about the social cost of carbon. I think there hasn't been conclusive evidence on the high end of the numbers you mentioned. I personally think you're probably right. But uh, in order for the public uh, and the political process to react, I think we need better proof. So we're working, uh, we're working on, uh, on that right now. Uh, on the mitigation side, having written one of seven critiques of the original Stern Review, so I'm not sure exactly who picked him for the Snyder Award, uh, <laughs> the, the, the numbers are pretty, you know, he basically picked cap and trade numbers. Yeah. or perfectly implemented global policy numbers, uh, which is what I wrote. And those numbers could be in order of magnitude too high or too low. You might have, some of our friends who are working on this, you might have huge technological breakthroughs which would push them down by an order of magnitude, or politics as even worse than usual, if you can believe that, uh, where the money comes in and it's not recycled, it's actually given to friends and family of people in charge. So I, again, I'm, I'm pretty neutral on that score, but there is, there is a, there is a trade-off a, a trade there. Michael, do you want to say anything yeah. in regard to so, maybe on the methodological side? So I think that's a really, it's a really important set of questions. Uh, and certainly, you know, our best guess is that you know, what, one thing that's not in this model are the reduced air pollution, morbidity, and mortality associated with a sh the, the impact, the, re the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, right? And that's, a lot of that is coming from coal gas switching, right? And that's a huge benefit, right? Probably on the order of $60 billion a year, if you believe the Mendelssohn and uh, et al. paper. Um, so that's... That's big. It's just not in the model. The, the reality is we're, we're using, we chose the model that we use because it is the model that Congress understands and is comfortable to work with. So what we're trying to do is influence policy. Now that is, that comes with a huge set of trade-offs, right? But ultimately, it's, that's, that's our criterion for uh, model choice. Um, anyway, sorry, we've got to wrap up. Anyway, thank you very much.